thank you. Thank you. So um, I feel uh, very lucky to have the chance to present in front of you. I'm presenting from my home quite soon uh, in Uppsala, Sweden. Quite soon we are traveling to the World Cup final uh, with the team. So the timing was quite tight uh, to be with you in uh, Uvascule. So I was asked to describe a uh, competition day in sprint. Of course, it's not uh, such an easy task. Uh, because you are coming from different sports, so I will be quite general, but we have some time for questions at the end, so I can be more specific if uh, there are things uh, you are seeing. So I'm 43 years old, so head coach of the Finnish team since uh, almost uh, one year now. It was uh, 1st October 2021. And I must say I'm very thankful um, as the Finnish people has been really supportive with me in uh, every possible way. So it was a very interesting year and now today we are going to talk about sprint. So during my own elite career, maybe people uh, believe I was not that interested in sprint as the last five, ten years of my elite career, I had uh, quite a big focus in forest. And this it's a picture of uh, actually my uh, first medal at uh, World Championships. It was a bronze medal uh, in 2003 in Rappersville in sprint. But for me, it has always been uh, quite important because I see it uh, when we usually have asked me what was the best way to be good in middle distance in forest. I have quite often answered it was to train sprint because I feel like a lot of the routines you find uh, in sprint, you can uh, have them uh, in forest as well. So it has always been uh, part of my uh, training regime. And as a coach, Preparing sprint trainings is what makes me most interested. It's, it's a lot of parameters to consider and a lot of things uh, can go wrong in a sprint training. And I have been uh, feeling it uh, very stressy, but also very enjoyable as a coach. And uh, if I look the whole discipline, I will talk a little bit about it. I enjoy most uh, knockout sprint as uh, it's a lot of uh, tactical running, a lot more than in all the other distances. We can see a lot of things happening like in skiing or track running. And a lot of people has been uh, skeptical about this format. But uh, for me, I find it uh, very exciting because you can follow the runners basically from start to finish and you see a lot of things happening. So first I will do a small uh, introduction with a couple of uh, basics, maybe not so helpful for a lot of you, but still. We have three uh, sprint disciplines, sprint relay, individual sprint and uh, knockout sprint. And for the first time uh, this summer, we had the first uh, pure uh, world championships in sprint. Uh, before that, the world championship uh, week uh, was about uh, forest races and sprint uh, races. But um, of course, it has changed uh, quite much because now people have been uh, getting more time to prepare specifically. And I uh, could feel at least uh, this summer at World Championships, the level uh, rise up uh, in sprint quite much. And I think it will be the same in future. So at the moment, it's quite much the same runners we find on top in both discipline in forest and sprint. But I feel in the future, most probably it will uh, split. So this, it's not that interesting, but uh, it's how you see uh, those three um, formats described by uh, the International Federation. So we see the controls in sprint are pretty easy and it's mostly about uh, road choices and the type of running, it's uh, very high speed most of the time uh, in uh, urban area and the differences are mostly in terms of uh, winning time and how many runners are running together. So if we take the sprint relay, it's uh, starting with a woman's leg, a must start, and then there are two legs with men, and it's finishing with a woman. And the time per leg is 12 to 15 minutes. And in sprint, individual sprints, it's 12 to 15 minutes, quite often with the qualification the same day. We will see this uh, later on. And that uh, new discipline, knockout sprint, it's starting with the qualification, which is very much like the individual sprint. So you have like eight, 10 minutes on a course, very much like in skiing, actually, like um, you need to, to set a time to qualify for the afternoon's uh, final. And then in, in the afternoon, if you reach the final, 
you run three runs between six and eight minutes. So that's quickly about this. Then what's common uh, to all the discipline is a little bit the navigation. So this, I wanted to introduce it a little bit like this and talk about the sprint technique. I don't want to get too much into details as I uh, will have uh, some different focus, but you see this leg, it's the second leg of the World Championships individual sprint. So quite a long leg, very little time to prepare. Basically, it was coming after 30 seconds running and you have several options. And basically, me, I have seen it as a equation to solve. And the number one uh, criteria evaluated by the runners is the length of the option. Of course, you don't always see all the options. No, I was uh, marking uh, uh, four options. You have the yellow, it's not so visible on this leg. And of course, especially when the terrain is like it was in Denmark, quite flat, you want to pick the shortest route uh, possible. But still, it's not all about this. I will make a small list of the parameters who influence the decision, straight running versus corner. We can look a little bit at the yellow route on the extreme uh, right. It's uh, very much uh, straight running. When we take the blue routes, you see a lot of change in direction. And of course, it's a very individual uh, uh, equation to solve because not uh, every runner has the same skills. And I wanted you to put you a small video of this. I think we shows quite much about There's this. a very sharp turn you have to take here. That's why he goes out to the right. He's already well prepared this one. Mistake, he ran into the wrong garden on his way to control number two. He lost about 40 seconds. And for me... Also against Michels. I think he will beat Michels. Will he beat Gustav Berrimar? She will overtake Alice Leek here. But Alice, she was fourth last time. Lead here. She's really got to run super fast to be able to make it. It's a fair so it's quite clear, like every corner is uh, affecting the speed uh, quite much. And also what you need to consider as well is, of course, climbing and uh, stairs. And every climb and stairs will add some distance to that length you were considering first. And now we can see on the video a pretty extreme uh, example. It was from European Champs last year at, uh, in Switzerland. So now we'll see, do they take the stairs? Yeah, we haven't seen anybody doing anything different. I think, I think you, as you were mentioning before, Jonas, the, the alternative route round here goes so far off the red line that it really looks like it's not a good idea. Yeah, and I mean, why should... Uh, I mean, they have such a big gap here. If Tuve chooses the same as Simona, then she can take her back. So we can see this. It was quite extreme in Denmark. It was almost uh, no climb, so it was a bit different, but something, sometimes uh, it's happening. And then the third uh, bullet point, I was putting it under the name obstacle. So it's what you don't necessarily see directly from the map and where the preparation before the race is so important because with Google Street View, we will see this later on in the presentation, you can get a lot of information. So I was putting like, for example, cars. If we take like uh, this area of the map, can you use this? This is a parking lot. So of course you don't see the cars on the map. It's impossible to, to map them, but uh, most probably there will be cars uh, in this area and it will be very hard to be sharp. So of course it's one information. And uh, then, for example, I was putting other runners. You will be, you will see it later on in some video when you run in groups. Of course, uh, you can uh, collide uh, with some runners. So sometimes you try to avoid some routes to avoid this, those kind of situation. There are also people. People are free to walk in the area. So if we take this uh, particular leg, this street was, for example, a pedestrian uh, street. So, of course, there will be people in it, and uh, the less time you spend in this street, the faster you will uh, be. So, if we take, for example, the red routes, this, uh, this is quite a long way through this street when the blue routes is a little bit uh, straighter. 
And then finally, in terms of obstacle, you have also the running surface. So in yellow, you have some grass there. So for sure, it's not as fast as uh, some asphalt. Sometimes you will get uh, cobblestone in some streets and the grip uh, and efficiency will be a little bit different. So this, of course, it's some parameter who affect um, the time. And usually in post-race uh, analysis, we only focus on leg time and uh, we see for each leg which one is the fastest. But it's a more complex um, uh, situation. Of course, you, you need to um, to see in which uh, in uh, orienting we knew we use some touch free controls so it means you don't need to stop to punch and of course the running direction to the next leg is pretty important so if we see for example if one to two you take the green routes so you will call, come to the control two in that direction and then run back break turn and run back to the number three but if you for example comes from the yellow routes you will come to the control and continue in the same running direction. So, of course, it has been quite many studies about this in orienting. And if you continue basically running in the same direction, you can uh, save five to ten meters compared to the one stopping and running back in the um, same direction. Also, this you can see a little bit. It's what I call the uh, anticipating. It means like you have this leg, you are running this leg. So this is a woman's course of world championships. They didn't add a map exchange, so everything was on their map. But for example, if you take the green routes, you will be able to spot the control number five and also the number three. So even though you might lose some time compared to the blue routes, you will probably gain this time a little bit later on because you have seen those controls uh, later on. So. We can see you now in that small uh, video, it's a small summary of those uh, two last points. It's uh, from uh, European uh, World Cup in Switzerland some uh, years ago, I think 2018, but I think it's quite uh, powerful uh, what was happening here. Control number 13, and you're going to win time if you back out of this one. Kibbutz goes straight on, everybody does apart from Ralph Street. Now that's interesting. Will Ralph Street be able to get a gap by choosing this option? Will he be able to just sneak ahead? It's going to be really tight between the four of them. Very well played by Ralph Street. I mean, this was maybe his only chance, and now he is in the lead. Ralph Street with that decision and Chris Jones is in second place. So Ralph Street, he's going to qualify surely with this run. So yes, yeah, this was uh, quite interesting to see. We saw Ralph Street uh, coming back. So of course he lost sometimes, but then he had uh, very much uh, straight running when the others were going more into zigzag. So yeah, it's uh, what makes uh, sprint so interesting. And also on top of that, as I said, it's a very individual equation because like not everyone can uh, realize, for example, the blue routes uh, perfectly without uh, doing any mistakes. So it's uh, why uh, this is the risk level, the risk you have to make a mistake is also to be considered. So I, I just uh, wanted to make a small summary how you, the best elites uh, are proceeding. And of course, there are more factors than this and some, some are interacting, like uh, just, uh, I find it quite funny, like if this is a um, rainy day, you can uh, probably expect like there will be less people shopping in this street. So most probably it will affect a little bit the speed in this street. And the grass in this uh, square will be a little bit more wet and of course a uh, little bit slippery. So I feel like the parameter of course can change uh, during the race and during the day. But when you look all of this, it's a little bit like this. I feel like it's uh, we are not running with a computer in uh, mind. Uh, some of the best runners are able to handle some of those uh, factors, but it's way too much information to handle. And we have seen uh, quite often big mistake because like runners have a hard time to pre re prioritize where they are in the race and what's the most important. So of course, like the current action, is always the one who will need to be on top of uh, everything. Then I wanted to show you still as an introduction, like uh, what is a World Championships uh, timetable. 
I guess uh, it's quite much in uh, skiing and this kind of stuff. But now we start to is uh, at this uh, World Championship this summer. We were starting with a sprint relay, then always uh, rest day after uh, competition day, and then the individual races, starting with a uh, race in morning, usually quite early, and uh, with uh, quite small margin to qualify, so it's a full effort. Then these championships quite a long break and all the final in the evening ending quite late, especially if you end up with a good result. So it means prize giving ceremony, interview, doping control. So um, this is uh, quite many parameters to, to have in mind. And if we look now, the result at uh, World Championships, it's quite interesting to, to mess, make a post analyze for the future. So in top, you have the top six at the knockout sprint in men and at the bottom uh, top six in um, individual sprint. So we can see the two speed. That was their uh, only race at World Championships. They were not running the sprint relay here and not the individual sprint. And all the others, they were running also the individual sprint, except uh, Loic Cabern, who was not running the sprint relay. And what's uh, pretty interesting to see is like the top three in men were prioritizing the individual sprint. So it means they didn't race the uh, knockout sprint, which was uh, two days later. And then from four to six, they were stopping uh, their journey in uh, knockout sprint in semi-final. So it's hard to say how much it has affect uh, their racing. Because we see, for example, Chris Jones, he jumped one control, but uh, potentially if we put him the fastest time on, on this leg, he could have been fifth. So one guy from the knockout screen could have uh, been top six in individual sprint. In women, all the top six runners except uh, Alice Leak has been running both the knockout sprint and the uh, individual sprint. So we, we can see a lot of... Uh, uh, the same faces in uh, both uh, races. I felt it was a little bit more equal competition. Of course, people are free to prioritize and it's important to maximize your chances. But at least in women, it was very much the same um, runners uh, racing both ways. And I think it's quite uh, clear in orienting, like the knockout sprint is very much uh, energy consuming, both physically and emotionally. We will uh, get into details uh, why, but this is partly uh, part of the answers. So it's coming from the Strava of uh, Tim Robertson, the guy from New Zealand. So this guy, this example was uh, from the World Cup one month before World Championships. So very much the same type of terrain and the same type of uh, setting. He was at World Championships fourth and at this um, competition, it was second. So it started in morning with a qualification, quite a short effort. He was very much on the edge to not qualified, but uh, he made it through. And then uh, warm up and cool down, about 30 minutes. We have the distances and in the, in the afternoon, three runs. So we reached the final. So it's uh, about three times two kilometers and a lot of uh, warm up and cool down. So altogether nine kilometers at high speed and uh, quite often ending with uh, quite high uh, like that with a sprint finish. And altogether 26 kilometers, which is quite much the standard. Some people will run over 30 kilometers and sometimes a little bit less. If we look, um, I feel it's um, it was the first time this summer we had a pure uh, World Championships in uh, sprint, so it's quite new for us and it's kind of nice to see the future timetable, how it's going to be. So I think the organizers are still uh, looking at the option. And what I feel is, so next year at European Champs in Italy, it will be the knockout sprint, middle of the week, but they put the sprint relay, which is just one race at the end, so I feel it's... Uh, bit of uh, improvement, but for me, the best uh, timetable seems to be for 2024 in uh, Scotland with the knockout sprint uh, ending the um, championships uh, week. So also I wanted to introduce, because I will talk more about it in the coming uh, slide, 
embargoed area in orienting, so it's something. Um, what does it mean for athletes and uh, coaches? Basically, the organizer, when they are applying for the organization of a competition, they also need to publish some areas they plan to use for their competition. So you see like this, it's an example for Scotland uh, for the next uh, World Championships. So basically, they published those areas four years before. So those areas are restricted and for potential World, world Championships corners, it's illegal to visit or train in those places. And this, it's really the base of our sport. Like people uh, outside of our sport have sometimes a hard time to understand uh, this and if people stick to it. But it's something we really stick to it and it's the first things uh, we try to get information about it because it will affect the way we will train in the coming uh, months. And this uh, reason mostly, it's like uh, it makes the competition more fair between the locals and the foreign uh, teams. And also, I would say, like those who have a lower budget, who can travel uh, every uh, very often to the specific uh, country, it makes it a little bit more fair. Because if it was no embargo area, of course, it would be a fantastic advantage to be able to live on spot. And I think it's uh, really good this way. So that was basically a little bit for the introduction. And then we will look a little bit how we prepare for this. So the basic idea of the whole preparation is what we call reducing the part of the unknown. In orienting, it's a lot of uh, things we don't know beforehand. So I feel like in uh, cross-country skiing, you can check the track uh, beforehand. You can test a little bit your skis and the, of course there will be change during the day. But in orienting, it's so much stuff who, who are unknown. And us, we will do like a lot of uh, preparation, study those embargo area and map them from distance from behind the computer. So it's something uh, we share the work between the runners and coaches. And of course, um, the situation has changed a lot compared to 10, 20 years ago, as you get quite many information online. So we will see a little bit uh, what I mean about this. We we can see, for example, there are some real uh, cool aerial picture from Denmark. So this, it was available. It's not available in every country. It's a little bit more advanced than um, Google uh, Earth or this kind of stuff. So basically, you get different angles from the di different direction. And what's uh, so interesting for us is like you can see a lot of uh, opening and passages. So you get quite much information and us. We start producing a map from uh, what he, what we see, and it becomes a lot more real for the owners. So here it's one example from Denmark. So basically, it was no street view, nothing in this area, no old maps. So everything we we made it from uh, distance. And this sometimes you don't have any good material at all, like street view. If you look this area, it's um, from uh, the World Cup in Sweden. So it's a totally new building area, which was uh, built up uh, in the two last year. So no street view. But uh, we could get quite many pictures of that area in some housing company. It's called Mnet in uh, Sweden. So it's a property uh, platform in Sweden where you can buy apartment or houses and they publish those kind of pictures. And of course, you see a lot of the terrain and uh, you can uh, make the, the map from it. And this, it's super important to be able to build up the mental picture and feel like you have already been in the terrain. So even though like during the competition, it will be the first time you will be passing uh, this street, you, you can really like make it uh, make a lot of uh, work of visualization. So it feels really like when you get into it, you have been there uh, training the whole year. So this, it's of course a big part of our, our um, preparation. This, it's another part of uh, World Championship this summer. Quite a complex uh, garage with different entries, different level and uh, street view just around the building, not so much inside. So of course we were looking uh, as much as possible. Some very old pictures, the one number one and number five were uh, quite old one. But of course, it will give a good idea 
to the runners and when we lay will come here, he will be a lot more smooth than if he was discovering stuff in front of him. And then when you end up with a map, so of course it's um, it's not the real one, so you need to, to have this in mind uh, all the time. But still it helps a lot for the mental preparation of the competition because then you can simulate both courses and different scenarios in your mind. So this it's uh, very powerful. It's something I have been using a lot during my elite career and most of the team uh, are using uh, a lot as well. So on this we can see, for example, we were setting like this. It's not a course from the World Championships. It's something we do in the preparation. And it's we try to stick to the information we get from the organizers. So we just get the distances, the number of controls, and thus we will try to. We don't know where is the start. We know where is the finish, and we try to build up some uh, some problem. And of course, this work. It's uh, I really feel it's against uh, the organizer. So it's kind of a battle against the organizer. I would say. Because they all know we will, all the team will do this preparation work. Of course, between the teams, some people do it more and uh, it's better quality, but basically everyone is doing this work. And I really feel like it's kind of important, like the result at World Championships are not based on the one who makes the best preparation maps. So it's also about the one who will be able to solve a new problem. And like the organizers have some different tools. So they will create some new challenges. We see one of them. So it's putting some artificial uh, fences in one street. So they block totally the street. On the map, it is uh, purple stuff. And of course, it will affect the whole problematic. Like uh, it's like uh, if you, you start driving from your home, there are like some roadblock uh, um, on the way to the shopping mall and you need to find uh, another uh, route. And this, it's uh, something which has been used even more uh, lately. It's opening doors in building. So of course, this it's uh, for the runners and the coaches. It's extremely challenging because we it's almost impossible to predict. So we, we will see an example, uh, Tove running through a door, this one of the World Championships. So this, you see, there is like a fence on this uh, street and the new opening, so of course it changed um, everything and this it's almost impossible to prepare for, so you need to be very flexible. Both to the 7th and to the 10th control. So this is very hard to prepare for. So, um, of course, like sometimes, when you prepare the maps beforehand, you wonder if all this preparation work is really worth it when the organizer do such a good work like at World Championships this summer. But of course the answer is yes. And the idea really of the preparation is to automatize at as much as possible to create space in your brain. So for me it's uh, really like this and we see it a lot like uh, with all the routines at warm up. I, I guess this it's a common thing in our sport. So every process will be a little bit faster. And the routines are so important in sport just because of this, like then you can face surprises and react a little bit quicker. So for me, it's uh, of course the answer is, uh, is you need to invest much time on this. Then when it comes to training, I won't uh, get too much into details as there are many ways to prepare for world championships. But of course you have seen it with your timetable. One uh, important issue is to prepare for two intense uh, runs per day. And too often you don't see this so much in trainings of uh, the runners. So this, of course, I guess they will get better and better at this all the time because this makes a huge uh, difference. And then we can uh, have a quick look how we prepare for World Championships for the Finnish team. So we have end of June World Championships. Yeah. The World Cup in Sweden, one month uh, before, which uh, served as uh, picking the team. 
And then the dream of uh, all the Finns, but also my uh, nightmare as a coach, the Yukala relay here. So, um, but basically it's always like this in orienting. The competition calendar is full of event and you need to make compromise all the time. So this can be very frustrating at some point, but um, it's, uh, it can be quite challenging because a big part of the runner's budget comes from the club, especially in Finland. So, of course, um, it was hard to to skip that one for runners, but we can see a little bit how it was for the top six at the World Championships. So, I was putting this uh, small Yukola logo on those who had been running Yukola before. So, quite many of the guys, especially at the individual sprint, were running... Uh, Yukola the week before and only Sarah was among the girls who were uh, running uh, Venla with their club. It was quite uh, worth it because she she won it. But yeah, as always, I would say like there will be always something which will uh, not be exactly according to the book. And uh, for me, it has always been like this. If you believe uh, this is a problem, of course, it will be a big one. So that's why, like, it's all about how you position yourself, and I think the mindset in the final pre preparation is uh, everything. We can also have a quick look uh, to our last uh, pre-camp program. So we we move it beginning of June. We of course we wish uh, it would have been a little bit closer to the goal, but we made a small compromise. Nothing very special, I think. Um, it's uh, something you can find in uh, all the national teams. So, of course, in the last pre-camp, you want to fit to the timetable. This is quite important. So we know when will be the races. So we try to fit to it. And also some small compromise because we wanted to benefit from uh, Danish championships because there will be good matching. The channel was not like um, as uh, world championships. But we tried to find a compromise, and that afternoon we were adding like a second fast session. And then we had a full uh, Knockout Sprint on uh, Wednesday with qualification and three runs. So this, I think it was uh, quite nice. And when we select the terrain, we can see one of the course of that day. So the Knockout Sprint, basically the idea is to try to copy what is expected at uh, World Championships. So the runners once more feel like just doing it uh, one more time. And that's why repetition is so important uh, in sport in general. So um, we had selected this map because it looked a little bit the same. Of course, the geometry of the street were not exactly the same. It was not always 90 degrees. But mostly because like the square, like this was very much like at the uh, World Championships in Fredericia. The size was same, so we could expect like very much like the same type of running. And um, we we wanted to be as relevant as possible, so they get uh, good practice. And I think uh, it was quite relevant afterward. And um, yeah, that's a little bit for this part. Then. One part of the final preparation is the last team meeting. For me, it's really not the most important because I like to believe that the work should be done before and this meeting should only be very, very short to say good luck for tomorrow, basically. And uh, during my elite careers, I, I remember there was a coach of the French team who basically was teaching us orienting every evening before racing. I won't say his name, but uh, and my friend, I guess, at the time will uh, recognize him. But most probably it was because um, it was a way for him to handle uh, his stress. But uh, it's not what you want to hear 24 hours before your start. I feel like the most important during this meeting is like to have a clear timetable for the next day. It's uh, quite important in terms of logistics, the cars, who drive which cars who goes well, so we are very sharp with this. And then we make it very short in terms of tactics with uh, just two, three points. 
and it's not so much uh, to do because like the runners have a different personality and can uh, react in different ways so we can see one of our slide of this meeting with what timetable for the next day nothing special but the clearer the better and then um we we can see some small point we had during the the meeting before the knockout sprint so it was uh, the day before in the evening at seven o'clock so quickly the first point the seven is uh, usually the most stressy one with a lot of shoulder to shoulders running sometimes some crashes and it feels uh, at least to me to see it as a game and smile before the start to be able to handle the stress so it's uh, why i put uh, the one who smile uh, succeed uh, best then uh, we had been uh, running quite many trainings so i feel like we were on the edge of uh, what we could do like um, you can always adopt as a runners if you are prepared enough but i feel like um, it was quite important to give them a reminder they are prepared and then the last part, it's more like tactical. We knew it will be quite short uh, running as the arena was quite narrow in this uh, square. So it was important to do your move early if you want to get a chance. So this, it was a place for the arena. We had looked at it uh, quite much where, where the possibility, of course, you have no guarantee where will be the last control. And we did like a few um, simulation discuss quickly some possibilities where could be the last control in which direction you could come it could be quite tricky at the end with uh, different routes so basically that was uh, what i wanted to discuss about uh, the preparation now we can um, go closely to a racing day with uh, and then I will go through an example of the Knockout Sprint Day of uh, World Championships. I think it was quite powerful. So when it comes to the food in our team, it's a responsibility of uh, Laura, our nutritionist, and Lisa, our cook. So basically, the idea is to have a good control on everything, which is not possible if you are eating at uh, your food at a restaurant. So that's why I think uh, every time we can, we, we will prioritize those options. Of course, it's way more challenging when the group is uh, bigger than 10 people. We can see the lunch boxes uh, they were pre preparing for the racing day. So of course, it makes a big difference. Otherwise, as all the teams, I mean, it's not very specific to the Finnish team. Huh? We 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 see this in uh, mostly all the team. We are having a strategy regarding uh, recovery drinks. So this right after the finish line, and the coach uh, is in charge of uh, delivering it um, right away. So quite important. It can be different brands or um, some smoothie, but um, quite uh, quite standard. Then uh, some people are using uh, caffeine intakes before racing. This it's uh, quite popular, but also quite individual. And for me, it has always been quite important to see. I don't know how it is in skiing and this kind of things. I guess it's also. Uh, use especially when the races are a little bit earlier than uh, than us but for me it's so important to see the big picture and when you see uh, the overall timetable with late racing because what you gain somewhere you should not lose it somewhere else i can take myself as a runners and i of course uh, read a lot of those uh, studies about uh, caffeine intake uh, before racing but every time I was racing after four o'clock in the afternoon, I was li limiting uh, quite much the amount because I wanted uh, as well to sleep properly. And I wanted to race well at the end of the competition week, especially when you run more than once uh, during the week. It's quite important to, to be able to perform at the end of the week. So always the big picture. Then I wanted quickly to mention bicarbonate uh, supplementation mostly to link this uh, interesting study from the Danish team. I guess uh, you can uh, Google it, you will find uh, the publication right away. So it's a uh, very interesting reading. Some other team has been using it as well, like the Sweet, for example, with some product from Morton brand, which is not yet in the market. Us as a team, 
we felt we we had quite much uh, other priorities at the moment but for sure uh, this uh, this study was uh, pretty um, interesting to it so i recommend you to to have a look to it then i saw it during the middle of the day like i think it was some picture of uh, not counting but waiting area in um, in skiing so um, I also wanted to mention that during a competition day, it's a lot of uh, waiting. And a lot is happening mentally in those hours of waiting. You will see a video of quarantine, so which is a time where the organizer do the last preparation. So the runners are stuck together during this period. So we can have a quick look at it. It's uh, getting ready and of course they don't know at anything about what the courses here are going to be they have done a lot of geeking they've done a lot of preparation this always happens for uh, a world championship specifically there's so many hours of effort going into having a look at old maps going through the um, say google street view things like that to, to get as much information as they can planning lots of courses so they'll have all of that in their minds as they sit here and they prepare for a couple of hours in in the quarantine uh, before they emerge into this arena. Chilling out, getting so yeah, so and of course uh, I was talking about counting, but I can uh, include uh, the last week of preparation when the training load is uh, decreasing a lot, and you have much more time than usual. And in that part of the preparation, you really need a strategy to direct uh, your mind uh, toward your target. So for me as a runner, I was uh, the last week before uh, World Championships, I was spending much time at the cinema the week before. But also I was investing quite much time on learning uh, different breathing technique, visualization to handle that specific period. And I feel like um, it's something uh, so owners uh, need to put quite much energy on it because like everything can go perfect up to one week to the championships and then they get a little bit more time to, to think about everything and then a, uh, a lot are losing their focus in this uh, period. So then when we talk about uh, elite sport, I feel it's a lot about how much you should focus on details or look at the big picture. One um, of the big talk uh, in running world, in running world at the moment, is of course the shoes. I think uh, most of you have seen the world record uh, last Sunday again on uh, marathon. And the first things you you look, of course, it's the uh, shoes. No, especially they are quite uh, flashy those ones. And uh, but it's a bit the same in orienting when. Uh, I'm watching a skiing competition. I, I have always feel kind of happy to not uh, make a sport where the material was that important for the performance. So I think it's one of the big difference. But still, um, it's something the owners are talking about it. So now we can have a look to what the top six of uh, World Championships this summer have uh, choose to race. In the top, it's a knockout sprint. In the bottom, the individual sprint. I think all the models are correct, but I did it on the video from the replay, so sometimes um, it's quite tricky, but I think uh, it should be good now. So we can see like it's quite interesting because quite many runners have used uh, different models and the brands they are representing. So we really feel like the runners are really trying to find the best model uh, for the terrain. So we look a little bit um it's quite trendy to have a carbon fiber plate at the moment so we we can see like uh, even though the technology can uh, differ between brands it's quite interesting so we we see it's not uh, absolute uh, priority and quite many have choose very light model those uh, rebook for example uh, from casper uh, fosser and um, yannick mitchells uh, very light, 100 grams, and probably they prioritize like the sharp turns and weight than flat and straight running where shoes with carbons are very effective. 
We can look um, for the woman. It looks uh, like this. So we find back some of the models. We have the shoes with the uh, carbon plate. So we can see as well, quite interesting to see like um, Tove has been using two different uh, type of uh, shoes. It's uh, I hope I'm correct, but I think I am. So it's hard to say why, but most probably because everyone was expecting quite tricky sprint in the individual sprint with a lot of uh, changes in direction and surfaces. And also what's kind of, uh, I find it very interesting, it's to look the model used by uh, Megan Carter Davis, so second at the Knockout Sprint and World Champion. So this, it's the shoes I was using yesterday in Forest when I was uh, training. So it's a pure uh, orienting brand. Of course, it's still quite uh, light shoes, but it's quite interesting. No, we can see uh, in that picture. Uh, obviously, it was a model which was working quite well at the Arena Passage. The runners has to get through a small river. Maybe not the best idea of the organizer, but still you can see like you have a lot of different surfaces during a race and it can be quite tricky to choose uh, the right shoes. But for me, maybe after all, it's not the shoes who makes the uh, biggest difference. Now we will get through an um, example of a racing day. I think it's the most interesting for you. So we can see, we can look a little bit into details. How we we and for me the best way to do, describe a knockout sprint is like every second matter. So you need to be sharp in races and also in between the races. So it starts with the qualification in three hits. It's very much uh, individual races and why you need to master much of different skill if you want to be good in knockout sprint. We always talk like, OK, you need to be a top uh, finisher, but uh, most probably you won't even uh, see the knockout uh, final rounds. So of course, it's a lot about orienting. The 12 best goes to the elimination rule. We can see here the result at World Championships. I wanted to highlight the journey of the top six. So we have it already in the final here. And we can see the qualifications starting from 9.30 in the morning for the first one, one minute start interval. And we can see the training wi three winning time about the same, 9.42, 9.56, 9.56. And the cut is plus 35 seconds. And we can see also like a uh, very small margin, one second, you are out. You, we see uh, Tim Robertson qualified 12, one second from being out, but he was ending fourth. So we see the strategy of uh, Matthias Kibbutz is to win his it if possible. So he can be uh, able to select his it in the afternoon. So um, then there is quite a long break before the finals. And people have time to get back to the accommodation, get a proper meal and eventually some treatment. And in quarter, you have six different hits. I think it's uh, very much like this as well in skiing. It's copy from uh, skiing. And then at World Championships, you can choose according to your result in which hit you want to be. So the top six was speaking this way. So keyboards went for the very first hit to get as much uh, rest as possible in the next uh, runs. And the top two of the quarter goes into three semi-final where um, you can see the rest in between is uh, quite much uh, only the semi-final and final are on TV. So you get approximately the same rest in between quarter and semi-final, no matter in which uh, hit you are running and the top two will reach uh, the final. There is no lucky loser. So for the first time, I would say at this World Championships, we have seen a bit of uh, tactical running. We can see some small difference in terms of times. Um, Chris Jones was winning uh, in 6.41 uh, and the slowest one was uh, 25 seconds uh, slower in it uh, two. And there you can see the time difference between the hits to the final. And there we see a bigger difference in terms of rest before the final. But still we see like Molin, who was running in semi-final three, he managed to be second. So it's probably not that decisive uh, advantage. 
In one woman, it looks like this. Qualification in 10 minutes with Simona Bersolt and Tove Alexanderson uh, winning the hit. So then they choose the two first uh, quarter. And then also quite a tight cut at the 12th spot. We can see just uh, one second more and you are out. One minute. So not so many runners are able to save energy in uh, qualification. And then we see the biggest difference compared to the men. It's between the semi-final and final. Like we see, the semi-final one will have uh, 44, uh, 54 minutes of uh, rest or preparation, let's say, when the last one, 30 minutes. So we have the two speed, not doing that great in final. But at the same time, Simona, who was uh, having uh, quite much rest, she was fifth. So it's hard to, to make a big conclusion. But yeah, I feel like um, the biggest difference compared to the other distance for me, it's the tactical part, which is quite new in orienting somehow. A lot of people think knockout sprint, it's much about uh, running skills, but feels it's a lot more complex and uh, something we really need to, um, to develop. And we will see it uh, in the next uh, video. Now you will see like the final part of the three men's uh, semi-final at World Championships. So try to focus on the position in the group when they read their maps or not the maps and the speed change. And also what I call the amount of uh, emotion and feelings when they cross the finish line. I think you can read a lot in their face. So now we go with the first semi-final. So it goes like here. But then it's it's really hard to tell as they wind their way then through this courtyard with following this group with Chris Jones currently in the lead. And now uh, I think the fight for a good position will be starting very soon. I mean, there's control. You can still kind of be in the group and wait but then at control seven to eight you i think they will start to fight for this top positions in the group yeah the seven to eight is a fairly easy control but it's become kind of characteristic in sprint orienteering now you have a transportation control to set up another route choice yeah, of and course i mean you that coming, when course. you have an interesting route choice you sometimes you have to get there and uh well, sometimes it's an easy control to get there, but then the next control is a difficult one. And of course, as a runner, you know that. And when you get an easy control, you highly expect the tough route choice after it. All right, so let's watch out for their route choice then into control number nine. I can't remember which is faster. I think they were all fairly even. They might actually all continue here. Well, Chris Jones continues. They all continue and they will go back through this car park. They've been through here before. And now you the can back see that buildings. Kibbutz is speeding up here. Yeah, he really wants to get a good position. The position. There he is. He's going to try and overtake the... He's already overtaken the French athlete. He's going to try and be quite close to Jones here. And they all dip in. Oh. And is that a mistake? They go in one too early? Yeah. Yes, they do. And now we all change. So uh, Jones in first. He is distinct here. Uh, Kibbert's in second. And they've maybe dropped the other two as we just lose picture with them. They go round the back of this building. I'm sure we will pick them back up as they come out in the other direction. Well, and then number if, nine... If this would have been planned by Kibbert, it would be... the the perfect <laughs> thing to get rid of the others but uh, well of course it wasn't planned it was just too early you can see it on the map where we where he changed direction and went in and there's just a few little tricky bits and pieces in here but it should be fairly simple i think there's delen uh, yes. jones is in the lead then followed by uh, matthias kibbert uh, Delenn is right on their heels though, but it's looking good for, I think, the top two for Jones and for Kibbert. They make their way through and the, uh, the Brits and the Swiss are cheering, but uh, Matthias Kibbert has to fight hard here against Adrian Delenn. He's really looking around. Chris Jones, Matthias Kibbert, he punches the air. It wasn't a given for him. He was chased right at the end by Adrian Delenn. Really fantastic effort for him, but Jones and Kibbert go through. It's... Um Quite interesting to see, like the Frenchman never managed really to come close enough to stress uh, Jones and Keyboards. But I find it very interesting to see the face of uh, Jones at the finish, which uh, looks really like a killer man, like uh, you're almost uh, afraid of, uh, of him. And in reality, it's a very nice person in life. So I mean, like 
this is a semi-final. It goes to the final, and like you can see, all the faces like they have a lot of adrenaline, and it's something they need also to handle uh, in the cooldown. So we will get through. But then it's it's really hard to tell as they wind their way then through this courtyard. We're following this group with Chris Jones currently in the lead. And now uh, I think the fight for a good position will be starting very soon. Yeah, so I had a small technical problem, so I hope I'm back. So then we will look at the second semi-final. I feel it was the most uh, interesting part as well in the um, same part of the course. So I want you like to pay attention to the Norwegian in fifth, uh, fifth uh, spot uh, now. Project Kral then still in the lead. Mika Kimmela, Loic Kapburn, Jonathan Gustafsson. No, then... my feeling is there is a small gap there. Hoopman is losing a few meters. And the, but these five, you can see a surge, I think, from one of those in the back. That is a surge from uh, Eidsmo, I think, there. He has gone from the, the back to the front, and they've all had to pick up the pace here to see if they can match and him, because he, see... he has started the run from home here. He has maybe looked really far ahead, and he's trying to run all the other guys away. You can just see the way from that drone shot, the way he was able to slingshot himself through into the front. And this is going to be a tear up here. There's still quite a few meters to go. And it was exactly the same moment as in the first semi-final. We've seen that they're accelerating. We see also that Hoopman choose a different route there. Will be interesting to see if he can win with it. But I think it was more a desperate move by him to just choose anything else than the <laughs> others. OK, so we wait now on the... Uh, little curved track on the way to control number nine. We will Which not way see will they go? Here. He's no. not coming this direction, so he's and still eight smooth. Still the Norwegian, then Gustafsson, then Kral as well. And it's going to be a burn up really here. They've got to go to the other side of this building. And there's still five guys really close. Oh, the Norwegian is getting torn off and just in the wrong side. This is going to be so close. They really fight here. The top two go through. Gustafsson is there. He is the Norwegian there. He's being torn, taken down. This might be a photo finish. Oh. I think. Oh God, I don't even know. I so this, it's uh, quite fun to see. And what uh, the Norwegian is doing is really crazy hard. Because even if he has anticipated a lot and he's not winning much a map, it's uh, very hard to lead because uh, he will need to read the map at some point. And of course, it, it cause, uh, consumes some time and energy. But uh, it was a very impressive Which move. Which I crawled and still and in the can, lead. Uh, still in the lead. It's almost uh, hard to understand what was happening. So I was making like some small uh, screenshot. And this basically, you see the control, uh, the position at controls of the runners. And we see the move of uh, Ed Smo from the control eight to nine. So he jumped from the fifth place to first. And then he only get passed by uh, Cap Bern at the very end in the running. So this, it's uh, like this. And then we will, I will speed up a little bit um, so we can have a small look of the last uh, hit. So it's, we can move it there. Coming through now, who is in the lead? It is uh, Tim Robertson, August Mullane in second round. Street in there. Street here. And they're trying to go through. So the top three are clear, but only two go through. Street has just got ahead of Mullane. That's really decisive in this point. And who's going to make it through then? The top two only to make it through. This is a real sprint out here. And elbows are out, but it looks like the bridge is going to miss out, I think. He does. Mullane goes through in the first place, Robertson in second, and I think Street just misses out. Yes. Tim Robertson is... So we can see a um, little bit here the position at the control of the three hits. And here the map of the semi-final. So what uh, makes make it so interesting, this, this format, and um, it's like what I'm calling unknown area. So... 
I mean, it's extremely hard to know before the race how will be the running, how long it will be, from which direction you will come to the last control, how big the streets uh, will be. So this, it's of course, you can be a little bit prepared, but you will never get the maps uh, beforehand. And you can see in those graphics, it's only Cabern and Molen who managed to um, to be close enough to pass some people in the running. So basically, you need to be able to change your strategy during the race and adapt to the environment and for sure be super prepared for the last leg. So there is not so much time to think and it's what makes it uh, very exciting, I feel. And I also wanted to go quickly through the final and compare the two final as it's very much two different strategy between uh, women and men. So we go for the women. They are ready with their maps. One last route round after a long day's work of racing. I always wonder what is going through their heads at the very start of the course. And they are straight into the map and ready to go. Almost looks like people running into the back of Yifan Dong in there. And they round this corner, heading out for this final. Maybe shows there's a high speed. And now they've got to navigate all the, the shoppers. Definitely shows it's a high speed. The uh, two-way really pushes hard here. We see that Van Dong is on third position. And there is a little route choice then through to the next control. We've seen them split up already a lot. And there's only been three controls. Will we see it again? It's about three seconds, I guess. And, uh, but back to his ground. It's, it's, I guess it's about 10 seconds already. So that's uh, it's quite a gap. quite a gap. It's a surprise to see a gap of this much. You can much. see the they gap is just growing way. and growing between Tuve Alexanderson and Megan Carter Davis. But I mean, we have a tricky, tricky second part. There's a uh, route choice waiting. Both to the seventh and to the tenth control. That's a section uh, they, was, they were specifically warned about in the bulletin about kind of going through these glass doors, through the buildings, just really makes this map so much more complicated. And just look at the speed of Alexanderson, it's incredible. It's, it's, not, it's not only the speed, it's also that she's, she's running like on rails. There is no hesitation, yeah. it's just <laughs> no. no extra meters, nothing. It's just poor joy of orienteering too much. They are ready. So basically, it's how she won the final. I wanted to show you this. It's the time uh, behind the leader. So Tove is in the lead from start to finish. It's a red uh, line on top here. And this is the time difference. And there, this is the control. So if we take like uh, the number uh, three, the top three is just in five seconds. But we can see like in the two following uh, legs, which are quite easy one, it's three to four. So basically there is no routes, they run like this. And then four to five is quite simple. And it's where she will really press the speed pedal and make the big difference. So she will double the gap. And why it's so important, it's like she will get her back free. So the other runners behind can see her turning and she will, uh, they won't gain any times by uh, having her back in front. So it's quite interesting to see how she has used those two easy legs, which um, are quite simple for an elite orienter to really increase the gap. And then we can see, of course, she's making difference and she's still able, uh, it's possible she will make a mistake, but very specific uh, with uh, tactic, which works uh, great for her. And then we can see the guys. It's uh, for me, it's one of the most interesting race of the year. This one and uh, was quite fun uh, to see and it goes in a very different way. And we'll very shortly see them at this arena passage. Here they are, these five guys really close. Chris Jones off the back, but Tim Robertson is leading the way, followed by the two Swedes. And um, it'll be interesting to see when we look back to the past knockout sprints. When Kibbutz won, it was always the case that he had a good route choice in the very end and that he was preparing it uh, before approaching this last route choice. And let's see how it will be today. So now 
The, they have moved the barriers here, but they will head through this similar way that we've all seen them go before, through uh, this school area, kindergarten area, and they will all go the same way here. I don't think anything will happen until control nine and then we will see an explosion of things happening within a short while i guess i think you're i think you may be right they've all been in here they've got to go sharply through this position and uh Tim Robertson in control here. You can still see that the speed is high, but it's not its not that rush that we have seen in the end of the semi-final for some of the heats. And I wonder if Chris Jones is just catching up a few meters here and there. But he will... He will be expending a lot of energy to yeah, do so. Yeah, exactly. He will indeed. And the colors here are a bit misleading. You can't cut the corner there at the edge. It's an olive green, not a yellow. This is the control eight. Control eight, and then they will go back there. And now it will be very interesting. There's control nine, you can see it. Just the wall of the house here. And now it will be interesting to see what they're doing. Okay, they all go the same way, at least to start Not with. Chris Jones. Not Chris Jones. He that was has expected. To, yeah, he's got to take the risk to go the other way and see what he can do to try and take back some time. He's got to push hard here, but this is going to be tough. A tough ask, I think. And now they we see that Molin and Kibbutz are on their own. And Gustafsson and Robertson go the middle route. I think. Uh, yeah. This may be good for... I don't know, it's hard to tell. Really hard to tell. They'll probably go back via five, is my guess, the group who have gone to the east. I think this looks good for Kibbutz and Molin. Let's wait for the answer here. Here's, Here's Kibbutz. Kibbutz. Here's Molin. And we're looking at the last control very shortly. I want to see where everybody else is. Here's here they Scott. are. Here's Kibbutz. Here are the others. And this and looks really good for Kibbutz now. Kibbutz, can he get his another gold medal? Can he get the first ever win in the knockout sprint? And Kibbutz is there. Molin is chasing him, but Kibbutz has done exactly the right group choice where it matters. He takes the title. He is the first. What a tactic genius he is in the very end here. He's just having the control. You can see that he prepared this last route choice. He's just executing it so well, and you could feel it throughout the whole course. He has control. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's planning, planning, and then at control nine, he's just hitting it. Yeah, he doesn't take too many risks early on. He stays with everybody, and he is rewarded then with another win. And it is... Uh, and we'll very shortly see them at the... So we, we can look a little bit at this same uh, graph for the men. So if we look like um, the Matthias Kibot is this uh, red line. So we see like he's basically never leading, but never more far than one second from the lead and preparing uh, a lot uh, this uh, final part. But what he's doing is actually very impressive because like he has in his back uh, August Molen who is not running the map at all, or very little if you look the picture, and still he, he mastered it. So that's why I, I feel uh, it's an uh, uh, incredible uh, performance and very nice to learn from it. And then um, I will be very quick, like now I'm uh, almost uh, finished. So I wanted to talk about uh, recovering. Like uh, when you see the faces of the runners when they cross the finish line between the runs, you can see it's very emotional racing. Like, um, and still it's very important to move quickly. Like some uh, will uh, continue racing during the day, but um, you, there is a lot of things happening during the race. You can really be literally fighting physically with some runners during the race, but it's important like to have a procedure to reconnect with your mind kind of quickly. And then it goes also with recovering. And this is for sure a very long uh, topic. We don't have time uh, too much to develop. 
but it's also very important to have a strategy at, at that point. I can talk again about uh, myself. I think I talked uh, about uh, it, I think, last year already when um, I was talking about uh, recovering. But it's somehow very important to protect yourself and your environment also can help you to protect yourself as you are very sensible uh, during those period. During a World uh, Championships week, I was always uh, turning off my phone and internet to be more in my bubble and stick to my plan. So because every time you will be people, uh, you will have people around you, they will affect you in uh, both a positive way or negative way. So um, for me, it was kind of easy because it was no Instagram at the time, so very little social media. But still, if I was competing today, so I feel I will do the same. Or let those stuff uh, to someone else, uh, communicating uh, persons. Because like every time you will get uh, comments or something, you will it will affect somehow your your mood in a positive way. Once again, it can be very positive, but also a negative way. And this you can't control it. So it's um, for me, it's it was so much important to get back as soon as possible after the race on a calmer mood. And I had different uh, techniques, listening some relaxing music or having some bracing techniques, this kind of stuff. So this, of course, it's uh, for me, it's important to have a strategy. And uh, lately on, uh, I think it was on Twitter, I got to see this on the uh, internet and I find it quite po powerful as a coach when you want to explain a little bit um, about the recovering strategy and I wanted to share it here. Most probably a lot of you have seen it already. It's some uh, diagram where you have like uh, expensive, cheap, arm, benefit. So it's more like for the big picture, it's not very much in those uh, hours after the race. But what I want to highlight is like the, the best recovering strategy will always be sleeping and also quality nutrition. So I think like sometimes we lose a little bit the big picture and focus a little bit too much on the details. And um, so basically I have been already like uh, quite uh, extra compared to what was planned, but it's what I wanted to talk about a competition day in uh, orienting sprint. And when I was looking those replay of uh, work races, when I was preparing this, I find this interview after the race of McCann Carter Davis. And actually, I think for me, it's the uh, best uh, conclusion. So it's 30 you seconds. You were a good runner before, but now you're the best. What, uh, what have you improved to this season? Um, I think my self-confidence is the main thing. Um, like believing that I can uh, compete at the highest level and just aiming to race like normal, like I do in Britain. Um, yeah, we've got a really good standard of girls in Britain and guys as well. Like the team standard is crazy at the moment. And I think we all just keep raising the bar for each other. And yeah, that's kept me focused <laughs> in the last few years. You were a good runner before, but... So yeah, for me, those uh, words are quite important. As basically everything you are doing in preparation on the D-Day is to make sure your self-confidence is high enough to trust, you just need to go out and do something normal. And I feel it's, uh, for me, it's uh, the way to compete at the uh, World Championships is like to make it, uh, to keep it as simple as possible. And I think it's the uh, biggest challenge for a runner, like, and uh, also a coach, to make it a lot more simple than uh, it looks. So basically that was my uh, conclusion. Sorry for being that long, but I'm uh, passionate about uh, my sport.